The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Franklin Templeton Australia Limited, ABN 76004835849, AFSL 240827, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All the information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Franklin Templeton. At Franklin Templeton, we value the power of partnership and offer our clients a gateway to investment excellence. We bring together leading investment managers with specialized capabilities, providing investors access to a broad range of fixed income, equity, alternatives, and multi-asset strategies through one trusted global partner. Above all else, we always stay true to our commitment to create better financial futures together. Connect with us today at franklintempleton.com.au. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interest and class selection, asset class selection always. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that also work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients, that beautiful holy trinity. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all the information contained is general in nature. So here we go. We have talked about the fixed income market before, and it has been talked about many times before. We're not the first podcast to talk about the bond market or the fixed income market. Don't worry about that. We're not uh, we're not Robinson Crusoe out there. But it's important to the markets, and it's important to everyone's day to day. And the longer that I spend in this industry, the more I realise that 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 the importance is there, and that. I also realize this, and my old equities mates are going are gonna to hate on me about this. The more I spend in this market, the more I realize the irrelevance of a lot of the day-to-day moves in the equities market compared to the importance of the smallest flap of the butterfly wings of the bond market. And a lot of my bond, my new bond friends will probably love that I've said that as well. So it's, you know, some tables I'll be invited to and some I probably won't be after I've just mentioned that. As mentioned, this is a follow-up podcast to the previous episodes that we have uh, spoken about before. And I believe the the initial one on fixed interest goes back to the beginning of October. So check in the Ensemble platform for that one uh, on that one for the original required learning. It's not really required learning. We're going to touch on a few of the things that mentioned back there, just generally sort of following up on where things are going because we've got bond experts here. So why not do that? Um, so this will also focus, just so that the educational parameters are set, this will focus on some of the more definitions of things that go on, the way that the, uh, that the, that the fixed income market moves, and what we're then going to achieve guarantee you is how to use the minutiae in those moves in the fixed income market to assist in portfolio allocation, assist with you and assist with you and your discussions with clients. That's what we're all about here. Don't forget that more of these questions coming into the Ensemble platform, the better. Everything that you need to know is on that platform and always will be. Thank you very much for the questions that we've got. We are going to get to the questions that you have asked about the fixed income market. We're going to get to some of the uh, some of the updates that we need to have as well. We have a lot to get through today. So we're going to make this as quick as possible. Fortunately, like I said, we have an expert on the minutiae and an expert in portfolio allocation. So we can handle both of those two things we need to take care of. And I couldn't ask for two better names with me today. Then Matt Weicher, uh, CIO for Asia Pacific at Morningstar, joins me to help steer the ship today. And there is quite a bit to work through. Matt, how are you now? Good, thanks, Jimmy. Beautiful. Absolutely cracking day. I don't, I, I don't like to give a date on these ones, but it's really good to be, to be in here and talking to you guys as well um, and joining him 
is Investment Director at Brandywine Global Investment Management, Richard Rauch. Richard, how are you now? Yeah, really good. Thanks, uh, James. Yeah, first time on the Ensemble po- uh, on the Ensemble podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with a couple of veterans, which is exciting. Oh, I, I just I just make it look casual. Any room, any room. I mean, I'm I'm doing okay uh, with those sorts of things. I don't know what I'm talking about in this <laughs> in this space at all, which is good. And that's what's good with me is that I always go into a thing, eyes wide open. Explain this to me like I'm like I'm a, 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 like I'm a 42 year old male who's managed to just bluff his way through you know, <laughs> bits and pieces of the industry. But it also it also gives me the advantage of saying, you know what, I, I'm, I don't necessarily know everything. Um, I, it is possible to run a wealth management company not knowing every single thing, but it's very important to know who knows and how to ask them and how to be able to retain that information and be able to use it to, to guide strategy. That's sort of my gift, if I could say. Some things I can do well, some things I can't. That's why it's great that I've got you two here in front of me so that we can start to bounce around. So um, we've got... An overview of the last, or maybe not an overview of the last podcast on fixed interest, but let's just have a look at some of the things that we talked about or some of the key points um, that were raised in the last one and maybe just get, go around the grounds for a bit of an update on them. Uh, now, I'm just going to throw them out there. Anyone who wants to put their hand up about what's going on, then go for it. There were Chinese data issues, not just on the last podcast. Trust me, there's been Chinese data issues <laughs> for as long as I've been in markets. And there was some difficulty with the EM allocation that was done in the bond market because of it. Anyone got an update on on China specifically with an up, with an allocation fixed interest allocation in China? Look, okay, I mean, I think I can talk maybe a little Thank bit. Thank you, Matt. Macro. I'm just introducing it's Matt. Matt from from morning, from, 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 from Waste. Um, Got to get the voices right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that you know property is still a very big issue in China, but I think lo- lots of the data points are seem to be starting to bottom out. Maybe that's manufactured, maybe not, but but you're starting to see some sort of bottoming in macroeconomic data. Um, you know, I think that there's still a lot of risk in China, um, they're, 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 but you know, there's some attractive valuations there as well. From from a bond specific specific perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll let Richard give his views. But uh. well, yeah, I mean, the the first thing I would say is for the first time in in a number of years, Brandywine Global has actually made an allocation in our portfolios to Chinese bonds, Goodness. which is pretty interesting. I mean, um, data has been pretty weak. Uh, China has been exporting deflation to the rest of the world, which is interesting. And the bond market's been performing pretty well. But one of the key points from a bond investor's perspective is China is actually a pretty big part of your benchmark now. If you're in the global ag or yep. the the world government bond index. So to not own it is kind of a pretty big active call right now. Yeah. The, and and we have spoken about active and passive uh, uh, that, that, that we could talk about. So we're not going to go back over that specifically. But yeah, you're right. You you better be making that up from somewhere else and making it up good, uh, uh, because if you're missing out on China, how much how much weighting is it on a on a set of benchmark? Uh, it's close to ten percent, depending on the index. Yeah, right? that's enough. That's yeah. enough to be. Um, so you know, we'll we'll get into this in terms of what that means from a, a risk perspective. Um, market value isn't the best measure of risk and in fixed income, I think, as we know. Um, but also the broader EM allocation. Um, you used to get a lot of yield going into China. Now, not so much. Um, and we could talk about where we're getting yield um, in other EMs right now. Yeah. Do, do you want to go into that now? I mean, we'll sure. Well, it's, 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 the update is the EM allocation to bonds. So we might as well talk about that. That's I'm, I'm fascinated as well. Yeah. So um, look, Brandywine Global is a value shop, right? And one of our measures of value is real yield. So what is real yield? That's... Um, the yield, the nominal yield minus inflation, some measure of inflation, whether it's trailing inflation or expected inflation. So that real yield, focusing on high real yields is really what matters to us from an investment perspective. So we'll just break down the entire global bond market and really just rank every market from a a real yield perspective. And that's a good starting point, right? And if you did that, I don't know, three years ago, 90% of the market would be negative. Right, a negative real yield. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we joke about Japan sometimes because that's such a low yield for so long. But its real yield actually wasn't that bad because inflation was so low um, going back three years ago. Yeah. Um, but now the rest of the world is really, um, you know, really th- the nominal yields on pretty much every market around the world have gone up tremendously. You're seeing some really juicy real yields, especially in EMs. So if we do that ranking, like, I don't know, probably – everything in the top quartile would be in the emerging world. And so the areas we like the most right now would be in Latin America. 
Okay. So markets like Brazil, um, Mexico, uh, Colombia, for example. So these are countries and markets. There, there are few benefits going on here. You know, one would be like Mexico, the whole friendshoring initiative um, with the U.S. So there's like a positive fundamental story. It's an investment grade market. But a lot of these countries, like they didn't wait to have a balance of payments crisis this time around to start hiking rates, right? They started hiking rates well before the developed world, well before the Fed did. Um, and they're on the other side now. Inflation is coming down. They're starting to cut rates in the case of places like Brazil. So they, not only are you getting strong bond market performance, but you're getting the tailwind of the currency. So that's kind of the investment thesis on EM in Latin America. I do like it when you get that currency that, that you can juice out a little bit more than 100% in a portfolio because of the currency that's in there. And it's not. this should not be discounted about how badly an investment can go for you if you get the currency wrong as well. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be in both directions there. Uh, what have you got on the EM side? Yeah, I mean, I think in aggregate, we're, we're, we think that EM debt, mainly local currency, is, is still attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got smaller allocations than we did six months ago. We've, we've reduced it a little bit um, just because y y real yields in, in other areas are starting to juice up a little bit. But still, as Richard said, still a very attractive part of the market to, to be taking some of our fixed income exposure. Not bad. Okay, well, uh, there's a few ideas that can come out of the back of that. And I suppose we'll try and maybe get them onto the ensemble platform so, so with some specific ideas. In fact, you know what? I'm going to say that we will have a special little chat thing set up on this one with some of these ideas that are coming up too. Um, I'll get Danny Yell working on that as quickly as we can. Uh, now, let's talk about spreads. The, the the conversation on spreads and why spreads are important was mentioned in the last podcast. How, is, how have spreads changed? Um, Obviously, I'll, I'm going to say our spreads still important, like a dumb question like that. Obviously, they are. Um, I'm just going to let, let you run with that, Richard. Sure, they are. Yeah. Um, they're tight. They've gotten tighter. Yeah. Um, so what does that mean, right? It just means your compensation for default risk um, has gone down, right? Does that mean defaults are going to be lower? Maybe, right? That could be one reason. But they've really just had this constant grind lower yeah. to the point where, I don't know, if you just throw around some numbers, the global investment grade um, corporate bond markets trading at about 100 basis points, roughly over um, risk-free treasuries. Yeah. Um, high yield is around 300. So both of those are historically tight. Yeah. So you're not really being compensated for that default risk relative to history. However, <laughs> this is the big, big caveat with credit and what uh, a lot, a lot of uh, institutional investors would point out. The yield matters too. And the yield is actually quite juicy mm. um, in various parts of credit markets. So you can get eight, nine, ten percent yields on like a short dated high yield security, depending on the sector. That sounds pretty darn good, right? Um, when you're not really taking that much, um, you know, spread volatility risk, spread duration. Yeah, no, no I would agree. Um, if they are very tight. You you are getting pretty good yields. Um, I guess you got to weigh up. Well, if for, for a risk free asset, I can get yeah, you know, uh, yeah. You know, Whatever it is now, four and a half percent for for US ten year Aussie ten year or just below that, versus the extra three hundred basis point for for high yield and and you know is it worth taking in a portfolio construction sense that that risk or can you just juice up your equity exposures at the same time and use the uh, the the uh, treasuries as a as a uh, counterpoint? Yeah, Richard. Yeah, and one one other quick point um, that we've been looking at is there's also the dollar price like the actual price of the bond or okay. the series of bonds. Yeah. And that matters too, right? Normally when a bond's issued, it's issued at 100. It's issued at par, right? Well, because interest rates have gone up so much since 2022, the dollar price has fallen. We'll get into this We didn't get the caveat <laughs> at, at the beginning. Sorry, now we got to do it, Richard. Yeah, all right. Every... Oh, kill me. Okay, the at the beginning of at the beginning and in every single article, and I've joked about this on podcasts that I've been doing ever since 2020 when COVID kicked in, and nobody knew what zero interest rates actually really meant and what was happening in the bond market that was crazy. We noticed that every single article and every single piece that was written from something in the Daily Telegraph into the highest level article in the Financial Times, which should be the pinnacle of very you know good daily sort of research for anyone who's out there. Always, always mentions at the end of a bond uh, bond market report that yields and price move inversely. Yields and price move inversely. The higher the yield, the lower the price. Uh, when one moves up, the other moves down, and inverse and, and conversely as well. Now, 
Well, that was the best part of the day. Everyone, everyone take a drink every time I do that. One day we, one day we won't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Not well, today. Well, yeah. This, this is what okay, I- Sorry, Richard. Wait. This is what I call uh, job security a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. The fact that this is a confusing asset class. The terminology is confusing. Prices and yields go in opposite directions. So yeah, just talk like normal people. I've been saying this for a long time. Sorry, go on. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so going back to the point, uh, so the actual dollar price of these securities has fallen quite a bit. Yep. Um, And in some cases in the high yield market could be like 80 cents on the dollar. Now, as the investor, that's actually a good thing because you have a a big margin of safety because if and when these things default, well, you usually get a recovery value Mm -hmm. on the company. You know, they sell their assets, they go through bankruptcy and all that. And it's usually not zero. Sometimes it is. But on average, let's say it's 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar. Well, if you have a security that you only bought at 80, well, you know, that's how much you've lost between 80 and 60, not 100 to 60. So there's a big, big margin of safety. Yeah, and there's room for that to go back up to 100. Yep. Right. So you have the, the capital appreciation um, built in. Yep. Which, which it does, which again, sort of just echoes it sings out how much... How much better it can be being higher up on the stack because when when things sometimes do go wrong, the people who get paid out first, um, you know, the the, the, debt, the debt guys are always the guys who get paid out first. The equity guys are often yeah. back at the queue. Always back at the queue. Usually that's the way that it goes. Sorry, Matt. No, I was going to say another reason to have a, a good active manager looking after your, your credit there because they can really – security selection is really important yep. in, in, the, in credit markets. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we've – See previous see previous podcasts regarding credit um, that we have mentioned as well. Now I, I believe that we've gone through a record, and I'm talking U.S. markets here. We've had the longest number of trading days consecutively with an inverse yield curve. Talking about the two tenths. So now I think that we may have even been talking about this six months ago. That this yield curve, which is supposed to have predicted the recession, that has just not happened in 2024. Richard, why don't you give us an update on the yield curve and why it will continue to not tell us that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is still inverted, yeah. right? Um, and look, us at Brandywine, we, we, we're we looking for valuation anomalies, right? And by definition, an anomaly doesn't happen all that often. Uh, but when it does, like you need to pay attention and that's how you invest a portfolio, right? I talked about value earlier. Well, the second piece is, is there a big anomaly? Well, the yield curve has been kind of this screaming anomaly for a while, right? And it is predictive. So it's going to normalize at some point, one way or, or the other. So it's either, you know, the uh, short end of the yield curve um, is going to come down or the long end is going to go up or some combination of the two. Yeah. Right. Probably the last one. Yeah. <laughs> so what's happened, and, and this ties a bit into the macro view um, to some extent, is that, look, it, That relationship in terms of it being predictive of a recession has at minimum been delayed. It's been broken down because especially in the U.S., growth has massively outperformed the rest of the world. It's outperformed a lot of people's expectations, probably including ours. And a lot of that was due to to the big fiscal impulse happening in the U.S., which has still been happening. And so, yeah, it does the yield curve matter? Yeah, it does. I don't think the economy can operate forever, right? It's an abnormal environment. There's certain sectors that I don't think do well. This is why the Fed would love to cut rates. They'd love to. Um, they're just not there yet with inflation. Yeah. But- yeah. No, no, I agree. I mean, I think that that uh, people, people have been quite, uh, well, very much expecting a recession in the US, so especially especially bond managers. No offense, Richard, but it's just never come. And then I think the yield curve has been a key indicator of that. But but as you said, growth and even the figures that we saw a couple of nights ago in terms of US unemployment, unem- uh, just the strength has been you know something that that no one's expected. And so that yield curve has remained how it is. And I th- I think you know some form of steepening isn't going to be too far away if we keep getting this these kind of GDP numbers. Yeah, it's 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 been it's been frustratingly long how all of this has actually taken to play out, and I think with a lot of people just talking about, I I was in the I was in the stickier stickier for longer camp, and I have been for for a long time, especially with the whole transitory thing. I remember transitory was like the word of the year a couple of years ago, and I was just like, it's not transitory. This stuff sticks for for, for a while, and I'm not an expert. And everyone sort of said, well, you're not an expert, so why don't you shut up? And anyway, here we are, and we're still sort of still sort of lagging along. Mm. Whilst food inflation has come down, and I have noticed that just recently that it that has come down, that that's good. But I think a lot of stuff has just been too sticky. We're now seeing oil 
oil and energy prices that just won't go away, depending on where you are in that. Anyway, that's all just me. If you've got anything to add to that, Carlos? Yeah, the, I, look, the energy prices, oil price, that's a worry. That's yeah. a big worry. That that often is a precursor for a reacceleration of inflation. But like our whole thesis around why this has taken so long, right, is because uh, everything that happened post-pandemic, this has not been a normal cycle. Actually, we would argue it hasn't been a cycle at all. It's been a normalization of like a natural disaster, yep. right? Yep. And if you view it through that lens, then the question is, okay, well, looking at normal macro data probably isn't going to help you out. You just need to wait for this normalization to finish, right? And most of this inflation fall we saw the last couple of years it's actually just been a normalization of supply chains and other, mm, yeah. you know, other factors. And any, everything that went up in sequence has kind of come down in sequence. That last little bit is very difficult to get under control, though, that, however. That is generally accepted. So, so, yeah. So, now we're at the point where I think that normalization is basically done. Or there's a few things working themselves through, like the fiscal is probably the, the last one. Uh, but now that that's done, you can actually focus on what we like to focus about, which is the macro variables, growth and inflation and employment and all the fun stuff. Yeah. Which one happens next? Do, do you have an idea of, I mean, is it possible to get inflation back down under 2%? Yes. Yes. Uh, the question is without a big recession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah that, that's the key. I mean, sometimes when, when the data point is, is, is so good, the only way for it to go is, is turn bad. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet, but but it's recession is still you know it's it's a card that's still on the table waiting to be played. It's, At the same time, you know this this reacceleration of growth potentially is is that is is really um, something interesting that that probably not, not many as we've said not many people were expecting. It's difficult to look at the robustness of the U.S. economy. I always I always direct my attention to the U.S. The Australian our economy will always muddle through as as we've discussed a thousand times before. It's difficult to look at this ro- the robustness of the U.S. economy and think how a recession could even be something that's possibly within our six to twelve month mm. outlook. Yeah, it certainly feels that way. Okay. Um, however, <laughs> on, let me give you yes, good. let me give you a data point. So, and, and look, I think it's fair to focus on the U.S. Granted, I have an American accent. I lived in Australia for a long time now. Um, my wife's Aussie. My kids are Aussie. But the U.S. look is first of all the biggest engine of growth right now by far like europe's basically in recession slash sub trend growth china has been deflating basically japan is basically in a recession all the big economies and we're kind of takers here in this part of the world of what's going on so it is right i think right now to focus um in on the u.s but the data point would be look at u.s um, unemployment this is why everyone's very focused on the jobs data even the high frequency stuff so um, unemployment's actually gone up about 500 basis points from the low, right? From the a- absolute low okay. in the US. Okay. And that typically, if you look at pretty much every cycle that's ever happened, you never go up only 500 basis points. You go up a lot more than that kind of very quickly. So it is a bit of a worry that we've had that uptick, yeah. but we're still at pretty low levels, yeah. right? Yeah. I, 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 it's just something that I've just got that is very. It's it's difficult for me to imagine to envisage, and if you can't envisage it, then I uh, I just I just don't know where it comes into it. However, I mean, I didn't envisage an entire planet shutting down for <laughs> for a few months either, and then the ramifications of that. My, keeping in mind that the two ten bond yield, the two ten curve had been inverted just before COVID happened as well. Yeah, yeah. It didn't predict COVID, but there was going to be a recession. It did. It was right. No one could figure out how. So. Um, okay. Do you think now there was inflationary outlooks at the time? I did ask you. Do you think that it's possible for it to get down bet- below two? Do you have a general inflationary outlook uh, aside from that in the next over the next twelve months or so? Look, I think that it. You know, it. If I can say it's trending down, but not trending down too too much. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah. As Rich said, there's a lot of the hard work has been done, and and actually. Or maybe it's the easy work that's been done, and and the hard work is is yet to come. If it if it is to go down, and yeah, I think that the people uh, will feel some pain if it really if if, if the US want to get it down under two percent, which I'm not sure that they do, um, given the interest rate talk about interest rate cuts and those sorts of things. Uh, then I think that that um, the that the you know, recession is going to be really on the horizon. But but I don't think that that's the case. And but I think. You know, lots of the, the 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 speak out of the Fed, etc., is that there are rate cuts coming. Um, so I don't I don't know how viable it is to get it below two percent in in that kind of environment. Yeah, 
I was sort of pontificating a while ago. It was about a, about a year ago, going that they're going to find it so difficult to get it down below certain numbers that they've set that they're just going to re- re-establish their parameters for, for how they work and just stop talking about two. <laughs> it's good because they did that a couple of years ago. So, well, no, I mean, I mean, <laughs> as as in, stop saying this is what we're yeah, going yeah, for. Stop yeah, saying no, that's exactly, what we're going for, yeah, yeah. as opposed to the actual rules under which yeah. they which they do. It'll just it'll just be like it's fine. Yeah, we just get it. I mean, but theoretically, what's to stop? the Fed from just maintaining these numbers. They don't have to cut, do they? No. They don't. Yeah, that's exactly. They don't they don't have to they don't have to. There's no there's no need. There's no cause for them to have to do that. That and and, and remember Powell said, I'm trying to think of when he said it, it was it was going in now almost maybe a year or so ago. And effectively sort of taking taking this in the context of which he was speaking. It was sort of one of those big earth shattering things when he gave a speech it was just like we're not mucking around, we're not going to cut. And if the market doesn't like it then, you know, up yours. Don't know if we can use that. Yeah, good. My producer, my producer has <laughs> just said I can use slightly fruity language. Thank you. Um, but but to say um, to say that, and, and it was effectively saying it's okay for us to push on and potentially break something because it's easy for us to fix something that's broken than it is to continue um, with these mm-hmm. low rate environment. So deal with it, and that's what you're gonna have to do. Yeah, and they, I mean, Jay Powell or any central banker, you know, the, who, you know, who do they remember? And yeah, you know, they probably have a painting of them behind their them in their office which is Paul Volcker, mm. right? And he's the hero of all the central bankers. They all wrote papers about this guy. They don't want to be Arthur Burns or whoever whoever else who mucked it up, yeah. right? They want to be the inflation fighters that got it right. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I think, I think you're right. All of that said, I think they would acknowledge that policy is pretty tight, right? And you look at where real rates are in the U.S., like it is starting to have an impact depending on where you look in the economy. They don't want to be excessively tight at the wrong times. And I think that's why they say, okay, cuts are on the table. But what's what's preventing them from doing it six months down the track? Yeah, they might just keep kicking it out. I mean, Kashkari came out and said we might not cut at all, yeah. right? And the market didn't like that. I mean, they, yeah, they kicked the can down the road for a long time the other direction. So it, it could be the same in reverse. Yeah, they, they sure did, didn't they? And that's yeah. so, so funny to see that. All the people who were just like, if you just like look at the growth now, it's time to sort of put it up, put it up, put it up. At least then you've got somewhere to go if the next thing happens, an either predictable event like a recession, which is a fairly predictable part of a cycle, or you have a black swan event that kicks up where you go, okay, we need to actually do something. It's easy to make that move from 5% than it is to do it from 2%. Anyway, that's me and that's my policy analysis and I hope that they take that on board. Moving on. <laughs> okay, so, so now we've got the questions that have come in off the podcast. So that's a good overview of what happened with the last one or where the updates are. From uh, from the last podcast, fantastic! Thank you very much for your help. Now we've got some questions from our from our viewers, listeners, and advisor network that we've got out here uh, going ahead. Is the bond market reset over, or is the choppy ride likely to continue? I'm just going to ask these questions. Whoever wants to stab an answer at it can go ahead and stab an answer at it. Did you, Did you want to talk about? No, no, we'll get to that in a second. But but did Did you want to sort of? We may have already mentioned it, but Richard, yeah, look, but I, so the, yeah, let's just talk about bond market volatility for a second. Yeah, right. So bond market volatility has been elevated um, depending on the metric and these things aren't perfect. But one of the charts we like is bond market vol versus equity market vol. And, you know, we look at, you know, the VIX like options markets and we look at the move index and the bond market and they've totally diverged, right? Equity market vol is way lower, has been way lower than bond market vol. Um, Will that persist? Well, I think it likely will. And part of the reason is what I just said earlier, which is we're back to your regularly scheduled programming of of macro data. Every macro release is potentially a big volatility event as people try to work out, are they or aren't they going to cut and when and how? And then the whole bond market will reprice as a result. Yep. That, 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 was, that was pretty much it. Now, we talked about bond market volatility. So, but we did want to say that the outcome of this podcast is to get some really good definitions and some education out of it. So let's just set the parameters around to what we're doing before I go into the rest of the points that are going forward. Let's define duration. Let's define convexity. And if you wanted to talk any more about, I mean, volatility is pretty obvious, but but if you wanted to talk about volatility, go for that as well. So we've now edu- put our educational corner hats on. Duration. Okay, this is going to be fun, right? I, I did a, a educational presentation for colleagues on I called it the dreaded duration session a number of years ago because it even bamboozles the most sophisticated of investors or asset managers or colleagues or everyone. So 
let me try to break it down and then you guys can jump in. So duration, uh, despite that the word is confusing itself because it implies a relationship with time and there is a relationship with time. But in a nutshell, duration is interest rate risk. So if I'm explaining this to my five-year-old, so if I say to my five-year-old, hey, um, you give me $1, I'm going to give you $1.50 in a week's time. Say, okay, that sounds good, dad. Let's do it. Then I turn to his brother and I say, I'm going to give you a dollar and in a week's time, I'm going to give you $2 back. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? First of all, the first boy is not too happy, right? That he's getting the short end of the stick. But that basically in a nutshell is what interest rate risk is. That first loan that was made or that I was going to make um, had a lower rate, right? So... Um, you know, as rates get higher, right, you want the rate that is higher and what you own is less valuable. Yep. So simply put, you know, it is interest rate risk. And so as rates go up, bond prices go down. There's a more complex mass version of this where you're discounting future cash flows back to the present value. Um, and so, you know, when you're discounting by a bigger number, you actually get a smaller number at the end. And so that would be my kind of intermediate um, definition of duration. And then probably the more complex, which is frankly just straight up mathematical, if you think back to your calculus class, um, this is the price yield relationship. So what is that relationship? Well, if it was a linear relationship, yep. then that would be a straight line. And the number would be the slope of that straight line. Um, and it'd be the first derivative of that price yield relationship. And then moving on, if I haven't lost you already, no, 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 moving no, no. on to convexity. We just said like, I guess, yeah. but like this is maybe more practical, uh, but, but generally bonds that have a shorter time horizon have less duration and, than, than I, I, longer term bonds. How big, yeah, that's, and say so, uh, a two-year bond versus a 10-year bond. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. moving it, and I always sort of do it at the, oh, I can break it down even sort of simple than that. How big is the megaphone on the movement that happens with regards to the yield and price that, that, that they end up right. Yeah, good. Bigger that's megaphone, great. bigger megaphone slope further out. Yeah. Smaller megaphones, so it's more closer to us. Yeah, exactly. You can tell that I've been, <laughs> I've been dealing with my entire career. <laughs> <That's, laughs> but what that's... people don't realize is it's a, it's an estimate. This yeah, is yeah. a straight line estimate of what the price will do if the yield moves one that's direction right. or another. To get real precision on this, you actually have to introduce new, new concepts. The main one would be convexity because that relationship between price and yield it actually has a curvature yeah. to it. So it's not linear. So, so then the second derivative, like you just said. So, how much? So, what that line looks like that will decide price yield movements, changes, and that changes convexity, i.e., the either a convex shape or a concave shape. But with, um, is that line exactly? Yeah, how possible. how almost how fast that line will move. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. We're good. And and I, I I've. I checked this with you before. Yeah. I, I will say I did have to check this with you before. Um, that I, I come from the old derivative space. Anyone in the derivative space who had to do their Greeks to pass their exams, uh, duration is delta or like delta, and convexity is like gamma. So that's it. That, that's the way of doing it. Delta drives gamma. Price drives delta. Whatever it is, you got to uh, just discuss in that. We're close enough. Yeah, Matt. And again, if you so if you've got you need to protect your portfolio, having more duration. And and particularly more convexity in a portfolio potentially allows you to take more more growth assets. So yes. you've got that extra protection in a kind of multi asset context. Okay, so, so under the under the context that we now know what we're talking about in in duration and where things are set, do you want to talk about do you want to talk about where convexity is now, where duration is now, and just get straight into talking about where we'd be able to alter a portfolio? And I can sit back and have a big drink of water and just listen to the magic happen. Sure, I, I'll kick it off. Go. I mean, so. Right. So over the last, I don't know, it's probably been going on for 25 years, the, the actual duration of the market, whether you're looking at the Oz bond composite or the global ag or whatever, and take, take your pick of the index, they've been getting longer. Basically, the interest rate sensitivity of the bond market that most people own has gone up mm -hmm. a lot. Right. Almost you're basically like double of what the global ag was when when I started my career. It was called the Lehman Ag. That's how far back this goes. Okay. This only started rolling over a little bit um after the pandemic. And the reason is simple. When rates got lower and lower and lower and lower, governments, corporates, 
you know, pretty much every entity just keeps issuing longer and longer and more and more debt. And therefore, the market's duration has gone up. So the market is actually quite sensitive to interest rate moves. Yeah, you had the Austrian government after <laughs> issuing a hundred year bond. Hundred year bond, wasn't it? Yeah, that it, it came out. So, so with with there being more longer dated stuff, there you go. I'm, I'm just going to. Yeah. But so that so there's more longer dated stuff, which means that the mega fund is really big at the end, which means any slight change here is going to affect that move. I just used hand signals for a podcast. That that's Thanks, right. Guys. If you own the market, right? You don't have to own the market, but if, yeah, if you own the market and the yeah, most yeah. people, that's their neutral point. Yeah. yeah 100%. Okay. I mean, there is the convexity element and that is interesting and it depends on the instrument and without getting overly technical yeah. here, there are like anything that has options embedded in them, like mortgages or, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, some corporate bonds have uh, call options and things like that. You know, there's, there's some interesting things going on with the convexity of those. Yeah. Yeah. But the overall okay. convexity of the market, yeah, I think it, yeah, it lends itself to giving you more protection um, than it had. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so now, with that in mind, Matt, how has that changed portfolio allocation? Well, I think you want to go back over the last 25 years. You, no, no. Uh, so, well, if we just go back three years, kind of 2021, you know, bond yields very, very low. 2020, 2021, bond yields very, very low. Um, you know, and duration extremely high. Then you have a year like 2022 where bond yields rise and rise significantly and very quickly. That's why you have those losses that people experience in both the equity and bond markets mm-hmm. at the same time in, in 22. But now where we're at with, with interest rates, you know, at much more normal levels, you know, four and a, let's call it around four and a half percent. Um, and, and they've kind of traded over the last year between four and five percent. You know th- that that's kind of much more normal, and actually it gives you some diversification benefit. You you know you, you, if bond yields were to rise significantly from here, you're probably going to get maybe another two percent um, or, or so. If that if that scenario plays out, the yield is actually compensating you for that that interest rate risk that's there at this point in time. So you're not going to lose as much. As you did back in uh, 2021, 2022, so, so if you have another backup in yields. Without being too specific, but, you know, just giving us a general idea of where you could benefit from from those particular changes, what would you would you have any particular area that, you, that you'd be discussing? Look, I mean, I think for, from a multi-asset portfolio context, you, we're, we're quite happy to own, as Australian investors, to own Australian government bonds, US government bonds, developed market government bonds. If we want a little bit of alpha, we're, we're certainly looking at um, emerging markets, but probably a little bit more than over credit, but, but we're happy to own some, you know, um, some investment grade credit as well. I think uh, Richard may differ from me here, but, but high yield, we're, we really don't think we're being compensated for, for holding sort of higher risk credit um, in, in the portfolio at this point in time relative to government bonds. Makes sense. Yeah. I, look, we don't, I don't disagree um, more broadly in opportunistic portfolios. We don't own any high yield. Um, for portfolios that are more credit oriented, we do, but at the short end. So it protects yeah. yourself from big movements and spread um, and to a degree default rates. Yeah, look, I mean, how we're building a fixed income portfolio so we don't have all the levers of, you know, equities, commodities, cash, et cetera. Um, we're still barbelling portfolios in within the fixed income sleeve. That's how we're actively running it. Even though we're not like pounding the table that you need to be long duration versus an index right now, I think. We would like to be highly convicted on that, but we just aren't. So as a result, it's more within fixed income. What do we own? So we like and are overweight U.S. treasuries. Mm -hmm. So we think there's good value in the U.S. And, you know, just the outright carry, if not some capital appreciation and that defensiveness in your portfolio, you want to have that as your ballast. And then on the other side of the barbell, okay, we don't own high yield credit um, or some of the higher risk credit securities. But we do own those Latin American emerging markets. We do own some mortgage-backed securities. So mortgages, um, big part of the global universe, actually, and and they can be quite high quality. I think mortgages got a bad reputation from the GFC, but these are pretty high quality, pretty much no credit risk in certain parts of the mortgage world, yeah. right? And you're getting really nice yield and, and pick up from that. You're also getting a bit of duration at the right part of the curve. I, I actually think that the that the GFC did a lot for the risking of those mortgage those mortgage backed securities those the, the, that end of the market because it's effectively you you can't make a mistake with that anymore because of what happened in the first time and the, and the fact that not enough people got 
strung up by their thumbs after the first one is that no one is going to get that excuse the second time around. Is it the SMA? I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. I think one other aspect that, that we probably haven't spoken about, but it's very much linked to fixed income markets is currency. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and I'd say that, you know, from it being a multi-asset portfolio um, at the moment, especially as an Aussie dollar investor, we think, you know, the US dollar is probably fairly valued um, relative to the Aussie. Um, but the yen, I think, is is somewhere where, you know, we can get some diversification, extra diversification benefit, yep. um, and it's really we we think it's really cheap at this that point be, in time as well. The yen versus the Aussie, the yen versus well, the yen versus the US dollar, but the yen versus the Aussie in particular for, for us because you get that you, you, Aussie is more a risk off currency. So that would be being it. long Japanese bonds in, I don't know, or, or yeah, or or just the currency itself, just long currency. Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. Given the bonds are, so we've we got a fixed interest. Probably the lead. Yeah, about funny. About I, 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 yeah, I wasn't <laughs> expecting to agree on on so many things, but in this case, yeah, we actually like the yen too, yeah. but we hate the bonds. Okay, yeah. it's, so we are actually implementing that in a portfolio. We're just you know buying currency fours and going long the yen now yep. that. That has been painful. I think we would acknowledge that that has not worked uh, recently, but the yen is at multi-decade levels of cheapness. And like I said, we're a value shop. Um, In the medium term, we do think the dollar, the US dollar will come down. Timing is critical here. I think most models would say the US dollar is overvalued. Uh, But look, there's been US growth exceptionalism, right? Um, in first, it was tech leadership. Now it seems to be AI driven or or whatever else fiscal. Now in the last couple of years, yeah. So the U.S. and of course interest rate differentials, interest, interest rate yeah. differentials, and, and we just said that they don't really have to be cutting anytime soon. Mm. Yeah. However, currency, the way we think about it, it's the ultimate relative value, right? So for everything you're long, by definition, you're short something. Yeah. And so really, this is not about the U.S. doing well or doing badly, it's about maybe the rest of the world just isn't quite as bad as it was, right? Maybe China surprised the upside. Maybe Europe surprised the upside. Only a little bit compared yeah. to the last decade, which has been pretty bad, right, for Europe in particular. Relatively speaking, yeah. But I mean, the European the European market looks fine. I'm, I'm okay with the yeah. European economy here. PMIs will shift up in, into an upwards direction. Amazingly, well, with this is a this is a fixed interest. <laughs> I'm not going to get on my soapbox about where my allocations are, so it's okay. But but as an active, so the way you build a bond portfolio, a currency, active currency, can be a really nice diversifier, yeah, yeah. a lever. Um, it worries some people because currencies are notoriously very volatile and they're hard to get right. But if you have a longer term time horizon and you build it into the, your case for, for example, I was talking about emerging markets. Well, if you're going to own the Brazilian, you know, securities or you're going to own Mexican on bonos, like if you're going to take that position on the bond, you really want the currency too, because hedging that out is very expensive. Uh, You're basically paying away all that uh, extra carry that you're earning in those markets. So, you know, it's a way to get, you know, to boost your yield, to increase diversification, to have a lever that a lot of managers don't have. Yeah. Now, how aggressively would you, so let's just take, so Matt, our allocation guy you know in a in in an aggressive portfolio let's have a look at that how much of an allocation would you want to be looking at for in these sorts of areas what are we talking about for brazil eight oh in 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 one of our portfolios yeah it would be like a five five percent allocation oh no i and and the yield oh the yield oh yeah the yield's like in in the high single digits yeah yeah yeah, okay Mm. okay so in an aggressive portfolio so morning start well i guess i mean it's it's good it's a really interesting question because in an aggressive portfolio you actually you Maybe you just want to have equity risk in there. Like, so if you've got an 80, 20 or a 90, 10 type portfolio, you might not have much room for emerging market debt or a high yield in there. But say for a conservative investor or a more moderate investor, you, you, maybe you actually can take less equity risk there and, and have some emerging market debt. Yeah. So, so you might, you know, similar kind of levels to, to what Richard was describing, but you might be able to juice up in a, in a more, Risk effective way, get yeah. a better risk reward kind of profile do, for for a uh, lower risk investor. Do you want to go into that for a second? I mean, as as painful as it is to say that you've got someone who wants to go within an aggressive portfolio, theoretically under these amazing rules of portfolio allocation, mm. I can't them allocate. I can't allocate them into a into a riskier bond portfolio, mm. even though I'm fairly certain that that is actually a more aggressive way that they should be going into it and be able to get higher returns, which is supposed to be the goal. It, is is there a way, like you're saying, to get around this? To, to, can you give equity risk premium without the equity risk, Richard? 
yeah. lady in beautiful. Just I'll give you the underarm throw. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I, I, I mean, the main point around fixed income is it's a broad church. This is not one homogenous thing. Right. So if the whole point of your fixed income allocation and we have a lot of it, most of our business in Australia is institutional. right? see so we know how they do portfolio construction and some, you know, they want a portfolio that's going to be that defensive piece that's going to be their anti equity. And they're not going to want much credit in that portfolio at all. Right. We then have others where this is their alpha sleeve and that's where they want to add things like credit, emerging markets and so on and so forth. So you solve it, I think, through product um, design and we have multiple products or you solve it at the asset allocation level. Mm. Right. Just by saying, all right, I'm going to have and then you have fee budget considerations as well. Right. You have regulatory um, uh, impacts in Australia in particular, where you, you've got to be conscious of the benchmark. You've got to be conscious about the fee. And so a lot of our clients are actually barbelling portfolios where they're saying, all right, I want to get some active risk. I'm going to get all my duration passively or through a core manager, and I'm still going to outperform by blending them together. Yep. Mm. Yeah. What do you think of that, Matt? Yeah, no, I think that, that that's exactly right. That's kind of what I was trying to describe very badly around, uh, you know, aggressive portfolio versus a, a more conservative investor. You need to get alpha in both and uh, it's where you get that alpha is, is the key. Okay. Well, th- th- there's a few questions here to go, but most of them we've actually covered through the through the through uh, what we've talked about in this podcast so far any, anyway. Um, so, I think that I actually have to start closing this podcast off because we've been here for too long. Richard, have you got anything to, to, to close with on what you're seeing out there, what you'd like to talk about? Like one one last piece, which we didn't get too much into, is around cash versus bonds. Yeah, let's just let's one go. last we have time for that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, one thing to leave with the listeners is that I try to remind people, like the cash rate or the Fed funds rate or the RBAs rate, is not the same as the bond yield. The bond yield actually is dictated by market forces all along the curve, mm-hmm. and that is really what's going to drive the performance of our portfolio, your bond portfolio, really doesn't have anything to do with the cash rate. Maybe there is a relationship. I wouldn't say it doesn't have anything to do with it. But you need to be more focused on the longer term macro variables or where growth and inflation are going to go. And because your starting point is so good, you're basically getting equivalent yields to cash markets with this big duration kicker that will, yeah. will come in at the right time. And and the right time will be if, if something does go wrong in markets, if there is that yeah, that issue that we can't see on the horizon. Yeah. Um, but, but if it comes, then bonds are going to help you much more than cash yeah. um, at this point in time, especially with real yields where they are. Like I said, the longer that I spend in this market, the more I realize that I not wasted time, but probably should have had more energy devoted to to that, the left side of the market, as I always think on the risk curve. Um, very helpful to clients as opposed to just having the token allocation to it that you're required to have. I really think, yeah. But you can't go back and have your career again, can you? Do you want to have your career again, Matt? You've done it right. Yeah, no, I've done all right, you know. Yeah. You could have, could have done this, could have done that. Yeah, we could have done a lot of <laughs> things. Thank you for joining us, Matt Weish, CIO for Asia Pacific and Morningstar. Cheers, Matt. Good on you. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy. And uh, absolutely fantastic having Investment Director from Brandywine Global Investment Manager, Richard Rauch. Thank you, Richard. Great. Thanks for having me. All right. You've uh, joined myself, James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team for another amazing Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. Any questions, please put it through uh, on the Ensemble platform and I'll be happy to answer them for you. We'll set up a little chat group with some of the discussions on this one. If you need someone else to describe duration and convexity to you, I think that I'd might be able to do it, but I have to use my hands and I can't not do that. So that's it. Our producer, Kieran Millwood, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Have a great one.